so he managed to get some more hands-on time with the Canon C500 Mark II again for a few days last week. During this time, we thought we would ask you guys what tests you wanted to see and what questions you wanted answered, so that's what we did. This video will be broken up into a few different sections. Creative requests, dynamic range tests, IBIS tests, low light performance tests, slow motion tests, autofocus tests, and usability and some more specific questions. First things first, we got a good amount of requests to shoot some more creative shots. We shot a few quick shots with a Porsche before, but those shots weren't some people's tastes. So our focus this time was to shoot more cinematic looking images and more skin tone. We shot a couple of different creative tests, but our main chunk was shooting with Angelo, who's one of our lens engineers. We shot some high key shots, as well as some more moody stuff in our lens test area. We shot using a couple of Cook 2x anamorphic primes, and the more high key stuff was with our Zeiss Otis lens set. I'm really happy of how some of these shots turned out. The camera handled the dark areas of the image really well and produced some beautiful results. While we were out testing the IBIS, we also shot a few outdoor shots. These also came out looking pretty good. Let us know what you think of these shots in the comments below. People mentioned dynamic range a whole lot and comparing it to the Alexa was mentioned a good few times also. We shot a couple of quick tests to put the dynamic range to the test. We have field of view matched the clips and labelled them A, B and C. Let us know if you guessed right in the comments below. We set up a scene with quite a decent amount of range. We shot with our Alexa Mini, C500 Mark II and C200, all using a Sigma 35mm cine lens. We shot these tests at ISO 800 at 25 frames per second with a 180 degree shutter. We shot with the Alexa first using its false colour along with our Siconic light meter to expose the image. Mid grey on our bright colour chart landed around T11, which was green or 38 to 42% IRE using the Alexa's false colour. So that's where we exposed. Our skin landed around T16, which was pink or 52 to 56% IRE. The sky fluctuated between T45 and 90, but we tried to tape when it was near a T90. Underexposed colour chart sat around T4 and the actual screen of the RTV Logic monitor here sat around T2.8. At this exposure, our Alexa was clipping some of the highlights in the sky and was starting to lose the shadows with a good chunk of the underexposed areas hitting between 2.5 and 4% IRE. When we switched over to the C500 and C200, we made sure the exposure was exactly the same and waited for the moment where the sky was as close as possible to T90. The Alexa seems to handle highlights better than the C500 Mark II with nicer roll off. It also handles the shadows much better, rendering less noise and more accurate colour. Due to the different rigs we had on the cameras, the height changed slightly. So on the Alexa, you can see the clock tower in the background, but with the C500 and the C200, you can only see the top of it here. The Alexa has very green shadows and purple in the blinds, whereas the C500 is more consistent with more consistent colour in the blinds and the shadows. The skin is also another point where you can see the difference between the three. The Alexa handles the skin highlights the nicest and the C500 handles it better than the C200. We also shot a range of over and under exposure tests to see how far we could push the images of each camera in post. We used the same technique as before to expose, but the base exposure was T11, ISO 800, 25p, 180 degree shutter, and then to overexpose, we opened up the lens a stop at a time. We pushed each camera to six stops over, and the results are pretty interesting. Looking at our standard, which is the Alexa, you can see that the camera handles overexposed skin up to around five stops. At 
six stops over, the image does break up, but it holds really, really well. The C500 Mark II does a great job also, up until around the five stop point where it really starts to struggle with skin, but handles the chart really well still. At six stops, skin starts to look really bad when James's head is turned. The C200 also does handle this well up to around four stops, and then at five it breaks, but at six it handles it much worse than the other two cameras. So overall, the C500 Mark II does not handle this as well as the Alexa, but does handle it better than the C200, which considering the price points of each camera, makes a lot of sense. Next was underexposure, and we used the same methodology here, but this time exposed for T1.5 instead of T11, and then stopped down the lens to stop each time until we hit minus six stops. We then normalized all the clips in post to the same exposure. All three of the cameras handled three stops under pretty easily, However, at four, all three of the cameras started to really struggle and past that point, I would deem the footage unusable. However, one thing that is really interesting is how well the Alexa manages to retain color when it's six stops under. Color is much more accurate than the other two cameras and you can also see the noise pattern of each camera easily in these clips. I think the C200 and C500 have a lot more digital looking noise patterns to them over the Alexa, which looks more natural and random. We also got asked about IBIS a whole bunch. For these tests, we took a quick drive down to Scion Park and filmed using four different configurations. We shot using the Sigma 7200 f2.8 Sport, which is a beast of lens, and if you haven't watched our review, check it out here. Handheld in the back of a car following Joe and his. The first pass was shot with no IBIS at all, and as you can see, it looks a bit bumpy. We then turned on the IS on the lens and did a pass which looks really, really good because the IS in this lens is insane. We then turned off the IS on the lens and then turned on the in-body stabilization. This looks good, but not as good as the lens IS. And then we shot with both the IS modes turned on. Both of them together is the smoothest. These tests aren't super accurate, and that could be down to human uh, operation error or different pieces of road, but it gives us a good idea of the caliber of the IBIS. Either way you slice it, the IBIS is a really handy thing to have built into the body. But I don't think it's quite on the same level as Panasonic's implementation of IBIS in the cameras like the S1H. One thing of note also is the restriction of only being able to shoot with IBIS when shooting in XFABC and not when shooting in CRM. A few people asked about the low light performance. We did do some ISO tests during our last time with the camera, but I thought I would retest the camera with the aim to compare it against the Alexa and the C200. We lit for the base exposure of ISO 800 at T2. As we increase the ISO, we stop down the lens to keep exposure consistent. The Alexa isn't known for its high ISO performance and it only goes up to 3200 ISO, but it looks really, really good at 3200. Colors hold really well, but there is some chroma noise present. However, the noise pattern is really nice. When comparing the C500 Mark II to this, I would say they are pretty close. I would say that the C500 looks a little better. When looking at the C200, I would say it looks worse than both of the other two as it has a lot more chroma noise. I'm interested to see how this compares to Sony's FX9. I can't wait to compare that with the C400 Mark II. Overall, the image of the C400 Mark II at base ISO looks really clean. We also got asked about slow motion a few times. When you record in slow and fast mode, your system frequency is what the clip conforms to. This means if you select 24 hertz on your system frequency and shoot at 48 frames per second, 
when you play back the clip or bring it into a timeline, it will play back at half speed. This behaves the same way as the C200. However, the fact you now have the two new buttons dedicated to slow and fast mode will make switching much quicker. The SNF button will toggle the mode and then the SNF FPS button will allow you to adjust the frame rate using the dial on the left side of the camera body. We shot all these different frame rates in XFAVC and RAW. So we have full frame 50p, Super 35 50p, Super 16 50p, Super 16 120p, and that's it. I think the 120 frames per second can look nice, but I think it needs to be in a scene with more light as this footage looks pretty noisy. I think my favorite looking slow motion out of the bunch is the 50p 5.9k CRM. This footage looks really, really nice, and you get the full field of view of your lenses, unlike the 120p, which gives you a Super 16 crop, which is roughly 2.8 times that of full frame. High frame rates is something that Canon never really execute properly, but the half speed footage does look really nice. And if you really require a more versatile slow motion camera, you could always rent in a RED or Phantom depending on your application. The perfect camera doesn't exist. Every one of them has compromise. It just comes down to the end user to decide which features mean more to them. We also shot some autofocus tests. For this, we used the Sigma 7200 f2.8 Sport and a Canon 24 105. For these, we shot a few different tests. The camera set to its base settings with face detection on. The autofocus responsiveness turned up to its max with James walking. And then James running with those max settings. And then the Canon with the maxed out settings. As we've come to expect with the Canon autofocus, this handled really well, but it did struggle a little bit at the beginning of the shots. To be honest, we didn't spend much time testing the AF, as with Canon, you know what you're getting, which is one of the best autofocus systems on the market with some awesome focusing assist tools. I also wanted to showcase some different skin tones in the same environment. For this, I wanted the setup to be a more corporate style, headshotty, interviewee look. We lit the scene with an Aperture 120D with a softbox as our key, and then a practical and a digital Sputnik 4 foot Voyager for the background. I think these shots look really nice. Each skin tone is really well rendered, and the autofocus was really great at keeping sharps while talking to our subjects. So onto the more general usability questions. Clayton Smith says, noise levels in both raw and compressed formats, slow motion tests please mate, and IBIS obviously, and does it have a waveform for C-Log2? General exposure metering tools for working with raw, thanks. Exposure metering tools, it has the option for a waveform, zebras, and now false color, which we used a bunch. The addition of false color is great as it's something the C200 doesn't have and is really handy to have without needing a monitor with the function built in. Keith Betters asks, can you tell us what this is? Nobody at Canon could tell me. As soon as I know, I will let everyone know. Steve Hayden asks, any new shortcuts that can be applied to buttons? Here are all the shortcut options. Muriel S. Nielsen asks, I want to know if it's possible to switch the V-mount plate out of for a gold mount on the EU V2. I've also been wondering if it's possible to simultaneously use the EVF70 and touchscreen. Canon are planning on releasing a gold mount version for the US, but are unsure if this is option will be available in the EU. Hopefully, they do give people the option though. Currently, the camera only has one of the unit outputs needed for the EVF and LCDs. So no, you can't use the EVF70 and LCD simultaneously. Liam Martin asks, it would be interesting to know how it matches up between its own internal RAW and XFABC. It took a little bit of tweaking and resolve, but I think the CRM and XFABC match pretty well. Though this is probably because when you look at the C200, it only has an 8-bit 420 XFABC, whereas the C500 is 10-bit 422. James Wards asks, I suppose from a sales point of view, a comparison with the C200 could be useful. Why should I buy a C500 Mark II when I can pick up another C200 for 10K less? How do the fe extra features on the C500 Mark II help me out on the job? I can't tell you why you need to spend the extra money because it depends on whether you think the extra features of the C500 Mark II over the C200 is going to make you more money. Drop me an email via jake at cvp.com if you want to discuss this further. Carl S. Miller says, Usability items, does it remember the last frame rate when switching between modes, raw to MP4, or does it always revert to 59 frames a second? Can you turn off the LCD to save battery life without yanking the cable out? Still annoys me like crazy the Canon hasn't fixed these for the C200. No, you cannot. It's always switches back, unfortunately. Can you turn off the LCD to save battery? No, you can't. 
The only way to do this would be to go into the menu and turn the LCD brightness all the way down, which will take you longer than you probably want it to. Matthew Ferguson also asks, is the camera not compatible at all with all older XQD cards, even at compressed? No, it isn't. And you can't read the CF Express cards in an XQD reader either. John Hall simply says, anamorphic. I went fairly in depth for our last video of anamorphic, but we did shoot some more. The Anamorphic looks really nice, and considering its price point, it's one of the best cameras on the market at the moment for it, even if that's full frame or Super 35. I've asked Canon if they are going to be adding any ad proper Anamorphic formats instead of just de-squeezing, but fingers crossed the market demands more of it. Dominic Flanagan asks, can you check for banding in high contrast situations, please? Hopefully that's gone. We couldn't see any in any of our test footage. Ollie Walton asks, agree with Tom. Be great to see something narrative. I know logistically this will be tricky, mate. Battery life, have they fixed the horrible banding in certain scenes? Big one as it's in C700. Damn it range, IBIS. And is there any overheating issues? Banding again. We couldn't see any of this in our test footage. Damn it range, go to this timestamp. IBIS, go to this timestamp. Overheating, we shot a lot, didn't have any issues. What's the battery life like? So the details I got from Canon are with a development sample. So this could be a bit different. The average is 36.6 watt hours. And then when using a bunch of accessories and shooting 5.9K raw, it went up to 61.9 watt hours. So a BPA60 is a 90 watt battery. So if your camera is drawing roughly 60 watt hours, you should get about an hour and a half of battery life from that BPA60. Well, that's everything that we got time to answer. If your question didn't get answered, let us know in the comments below and we will try our best to give you an answer. We're planning on doing a full comparison against the FX9 as soon as we get our hands on that. So make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to make sure you catch it as soon as possible.